Math 242, Quest to College. I'm Joe Vasta, and let's do review three. Okay, I to the 26th. Well, we know that I to the 0 is 1, and I to the 1 is I, or the square root of negative 1. I squared is negative 1, I cubed is negative I. Now, once you go back, whoa, it's just smeared it there. Once we go back to I to the fourth, I to the fourth then is one, and then this is I to the fifth, I to the sixth, I to the seventh, I to the eighth. So it cycles in four. So the quick way of doing this problem is to take the 26 and put four into it. Four goes into 26 how many times? Six, six times four is 24. We subtract and we get a two. This is what we're paying attention to. So the quick, fast way of doing this is I to the 26 equals I squared, which equals negative one. So if you get something like this on the test, it will probably be a multiple choice. I'll probably throw a fifth choice in. I'll probably throw in zero um, and see if anybody falls for that. That will never happen where you have i to a power equals zero. So that is how you do problem number 24 on 3.4. So I just selected some problems. Okay, 3.4, number 41, which... You know, I try not to pick too many problems that you've already worked in your homework, but I felt like this was a good problem. Um, what we want to do is we want to find all the zeros, and we want to factor this over the complex numbers. Now, your homework also says factor over the real numbers. On the exam, I'll ask you to factor over the complex numbers, so we'll do those two things. Find the zeros and factor, over, factor completely over the complex numbers. Okay, the first thing we want to do is start our list. Now our list is going to be factors of 5, 1 and 5, over factors, that's the constant coefficient, divided by the factors of the leading coefficients, 1 and 3. This is the rational zeros theorem, as they called it, and it creates a list. It creates the plus or minus 1, plus or minus 5, plus or minus one-third, plus or minus one-fifth. So we're going to go ahead and see what works on here. I'll start off with a one, and I'll do what I did in that other problem, where I do some synthetic division. So negative three, negative eight, negative twelve, twelve, negative five. I know this is not going to work because those coefficients do not add up to zero, but we'll go through this anyway. So that drops down, the negative three drops down, and we multiply and add. Multiply and add. Multiply and add. This is going to give me negative 11. Multiply and add. So it looks as if we don't have a remainder of zero, so one does not work. Let's try negative one. Okay, so we have set the same, same thing up here. And I guarantee you that, you know, on a test, you won't have to go beyond the fourth one if you write your list like I've been writing it. This drops down, we multiply and add. Multiply and add. Multiply. Hold on, did something go wrong here? Multiply and add. Make sure I wrote the problem down correctly. I think I did. So, oh, 
okay. So this is the, the bad part about making videos is I actually did not write this negative here. That could throw off a lot of stuff. So there's a negative there, which means that this number would have been negative 35 and then we'd have a negative 35 here good old whiteout it's my friend today oh come on maybe it's not see I just jinxed it okay I don't think it's it's really not going to matter in this problem but I should be a little more careful and then this is going to be I think negative 40 okay well that looks nice okay so 24 okay let's the, actually we've cut this before I got to it so I I multiplied and got the 7 I'm adding and getting negative 5 multiply and this gives me what I want this gives me a remainder of 0 which means we factor that polynomial into x plus 1 okay so negative 1 will zero that out and then this gives me the coefficients for my not fourth degree but third degree polynomial so this is negative 3x cubed minus 5x squared minus 7x minus 5 now you can look at this on your own you know you can pause the video and check that this thing will not factor by grouping so we've got to do another synthetic division we actually have the same leading coefficient as that we had up here in the same constant coefficient so you'll have the same list of course one is not going to work because it didn't work there negative one might work again so let's go ahead and try that make sure I'm writing the numbers down correctly this time which I'm not ha this is great I might need some new whiteout okay there it is okay so I'm writing these coefficients negative 5 and then we have negative 7 and negative 5 so let's go ahead and do some synthetic division. Negative 3 drops down, we multiply and add. Multiply and add. Multiply, I get a remainder of 0. So this is going to tell me this thing factors again. And when it factors, I have f of x equals I'm going to move this up so we're not going to see everything now it's going to um i have just factored out another x plus one so this is going to be x plus one times x plus one or x plus one squared and then we have this right here negative three x squared minus two x minus five and we're trying to find the zeros and factor it completely so let's continue. Okay, I know when I set this thing equal to zero, that I'm going to get negative one and negative one. It's going to have multiplicity too. Now this thing might be able to be factored. I'm going to factor a negative one out of there. So let's just rewrite this thing. F of x equals. I'll factor the negative out of this factor and I'll throw it out front. So I'll have a 3x squared plus 2x plus 5 and I'm trying to find the zeros. Now let's see if this thing factors over the rationals. 3 times 5 is 15. Factors of 15 would be 1 and 15 to no, 3 and 5. Do any of them add up to give you 2? The answer is no. 
So what we have to do is we have to do the quadratic formula on this guy. Minus b plus or minus Remember, negative boy couldn't decide on the radical party. The boy was a square. He lost four awesome chicks, and it was all over by 2 a.m. We don't put the m there. So I'm doing the quadratic formula on this guy right here. Okay, where a is 3, b is 2, c is 5. So we're going to plug this in. We have minus 2. Um, plus or minus square root of 2 squared, which is 4, minus 4 times A times C, all over 2 times A. Okay, so I have negative 2 plus or minus the square root of 4 minus this looks to be a big number here. Um, 15 times 4, which looks like it's 60, all over 6. Okay, so this gives me negative 2 plus or minus the square root of negative 56, all over 6. Now, it used to be we would just run away from those. But now, we can um, write this as, in terms of i. So 56, let's see, what goes into 56? 4 might go into 56, and it goes nicely. So this actually becomes negative 2 plus or minus. So we take the square root of 4, we could take that outside, that's... 2, we could take the square root of the i, or of the negative 1, which is i, and we're left with the square root of 14. This is all over 6. Okay, I'll factor. This is where I usually ask you guys, should we split this fraction or factor out a 2 and divide? I'll factor out the 2 this time. This is all over 6, and the 2 and the 6 can cancel. So it looks like we have negative 1 plus or minus i root 14 all over 3. Now, I think your book writes it, so you could write it like this, they write it as negative one-third, they split the fraction, plus or minus root 14 over 3, and then they put the i right there, as long as it doesn't creep under the square root or fall down to the bottom. So this polynomial has, actually, I better not make this go up, it has four zeros, it, it was originally A fourth degree polynomial it still is it's going to have four zeros counting the multiplicity so the zeros happen to be we get the first one here negative one has multiplicity two and then there's two more right here so one two one two that counts as two and then three four so um, I'll just use this one right here this is negative one I'll write them both separately plus I root 14. You don't have to write them both separately. And then negative 1 minus I root 14. And there it is. Those are the zeros. And there's three of them, but they count, kind of count as four because that one has multiplicity too. And we're going to factor the polynomial over the complex numbers. Now when it's factored over the real numbers, um, that's what it looks like. But when it's factored over the complex numbers, we have this negative, and 
and we have x plus 1 squared, and then we can factor this, this orange part here. So it's going to be x minus each of these zeros. So here's the first one. Negative 1 plus i root 14 over 3. And then this is going to be x minus negative 1 minus i root 14 over 3. Before we box our answer, let's check the leading coefficient. The leading coefficient is x squared times x times x, so that's x to the fourth, negative x to the fourth. Our leading coefficient in the original problem was negative 3x to the fourth. So we need a negative 3 out front. Where did we lose that 3? When Perhaps it was when we divide it. Um, there's our answer. So that completes problem number 41 in 3.4. Let's take a look at some more problems. Here is 4.1, 4.2. And we're going to go ahead and do this one problem here where we find all the stuff, the intercepts, the asymptotes, the holes, and then we're going to graph it. So that's what we'll do on this problem here. So the first thing that I want to do is I want to go ahead and see if these things can factor. Um, we went over factoring techniques the big X. I'm not going to do the big X here because I want to have time to finish all the problems. A lot of teachers call this trial and error. And I'm kind of doing it that way here. Hoping that I, it works out. So there's 3x squared minus 3x minus 7x plus 7. Okay, good. And the bottom, a little easier to do. Here's x, here's x, 2 and 1, and they both get minuses. So we have factored that. Okay, still looking good. So now what we're going to do is we see this x minus 1 can cancel. And so, you know, we have this graph right here. But when those x minus 1s cancel, you'll have a slightly different graph. 3x minus 7 all over x minus 2. So this is a different graph. And for the most part, except for domain and holes, we'll analyze this smaller graph. So let's go ahead and state the domain. The domain is all real numbers except where you have problems on the bottom. All real numbers except 1 and 2. And they always like us to write this in interval notation. So if we have negative infinity to 1, union. 1 to 2, all parentheses, union. 2 to infinity. There's the domain. I guess what we'll find next is the hole in the graph. You get the hole when you cancel. So the hole in the graph is going to have an x value of you take the thing that you canceled, which would be x minus 1, and you set it equal to 0. So x equals 1, that is the hole in the graph. So this here, which came from these guys, gave us that. Now, how do I find the y-coordinate of the hole? I plug the x-coordinate not into the original function, because that will zero out the bottom, but I plug this x-coordinate into the new function to find out the y-coordinate. So this is going to be y equals 3 minus 7 all over 1 minus 2. 
So you end up getting negative 4 on the top and negative 1 on the bottom. The y value of the whole is 4. We kind of did that in purple so you can see if you're looking back. So there's the hole. The hole is at 1, 4. Okay, let's go ahead and find, let's find the vertical asymptote now. The vertical asymptote is, the rule is you reduce the fraction and you set the bottom equal to 0. So you solve that equation, you get x equals 2 x equals 2 is the vertical asymptote. And so we did this work right here, which gave us this answer. The horizontal asymptote, you look at the degree of the polynomial on the top, because that's all rational functions are, polynomial over polynomial. The degree is 1 and the degree on the bottom is 1. So what you do is you put leading coefficient over the leading coefficient. So this is, you know, 3 over 1. Now we don't want to just say 3 for the horizontal asymptote. We want to say y equals 3. And that gives us the horizontal asymptote. We could have actually gone to the original function and got the same results. Okay, the next thing that we could just jot down is the slant asymptotes. None. And in this class, um, on the test, we're not going to have you find slant asymptotes because you know, we have quite a semester going on with, with this whole shelter in place and Quest uh, closing its face-to-face -face classes down, so um, that is what we do. And also, we got these this weird thing in our society about toilet paper rations, and so that's kind of that's what we have here. This is this is the topic. So I'm telling my family, okay, when you use it, put some scissors near the toilet. There we go. And so just just be careful, like. If you're tired, this could be really messy, and you just just use one of these, throw it in there, and then then cut another square. So that's that's what we're doing. We're we're running low, so we have to do that. Okay. So let's go ahead and find the y-intercept. Now, how do I find the y-intercept? I don't know why I boxed it, but we'll find the y-intercept. You set x equal to 0. When I set x equal to 0, um, I end up getting y equals 0 minus 7, and on the bottom we have 0 minus 2. So I have y equals, looks like it's going to be 7 halves. You don't want to write y equals 7 halves. I'll accept just a 7 halves, or we could just write it as 8.0, 7 halves. And so that there is the y-intercept. The x-intercept, you set y equal to 0, and we're looking at this reduced fraction here. So when you set y equal to 0, you end up having that right there. Multiply both sides by x minus 2 or cross multiply. This is 0 over 1. You're, end up, you're going to end up just having the top set equal to 0. You subtract, no, you add a 7 and you divide by 3 and you end up getting 7 thirds for the x-intercept. So here's 
calculations for the x-intercept. We are running out of colors, I think. This is going to be 7 thirds, or you could write 7 thirds comma 0. So there's the x-intercept. Back to the slant asymptote. Um, the way you will have a slant asymptote is if the degree on the top is one more than the degree on the bottom. Uh, the camera keeps clicking, so from every once in a while I'll get up to see what's happening with it. Hopefully it doesn't break. Um, okay, so one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Because I'm graphing this, I'm going to ask if there is a break in the horizontal asymptote. That's going to be a yes or a no. To see if there's a break in the horizontal asymptote, um, the horizontal asymptote is y equals 3, and my graph here, the simplified graph, is y equals 3x minus 7 over x minus 2. So I go ahead and I put that into, I put the y equals 3 into the y, so I have 3 equals 3x minus 7 over x minus 2. I multiply both sides of the equation by x minus 2. And I distribute the 3. I subtract 3x on both sides. I get negative 6 equals negative 7. That's false. So what does that tell me about the break in the horizontal asymptote? The answer is no. And the color we'll use for that. Yeah, we have pink. I didn't want to use it, but here it is. No. Okay, so now what I want to do is I want to take all the information that I have and I want to graph the graph. So that is what I want to do. How am I going to do that? See, on whiteboards, I'd have a lot more space. I want to make sure you see everything that I'm doing. So I'm going to go ahead and put the graph. See. Right here. Okay, so with the graph, there's the y-axis, here's the x-axis. I'm kind of going off the camera, I think. I'll move this center when I put all the stuff on. So here's y. Um, I have a vertical asymptote at x equals 2. one here's x equals 2 and a horizontal asymptote at y equals 3 I know that none of these walls are broken the vertical ones are never broken the horizontal ones can be broken and if they're broken you'd find it when you did this calculation um, what else do we have we have a y-intercept at 0 3 and a half zero three and a half is right here and really we said that was seven halves I have an x-intercept at seven thirds which is two and one third two and one third so here's three two and one third is right here so this is seven thirds I have a hole in the graph at one four so here's 1, 4 is probably right up here. And so I've got two regions to check. I have the region from negative infinity to the wall x equals 2. And we ask ourselves, is the graph above or below? Well, we see some 
a, a point above and a hole above, so we know the graph is going to be like this. Could you always plot more points? Yep. And then um, for the wall, x equals 2 all the way to infinity, we ask ourselves the question, will the graph be below where that point is, or will it be above? And it's going to be below because there's a point there. And these are functions, so you're not going to have two graphs, one flying above and below. These are functions. They pass the vertical line test, and it's going to go like that. And so there's the picture. This problem took a long time. Um, so it might be broken up into more than one problem on your exam, or you might get different aspects of it. And so let's move on to the next problem. And as you can see, it was raining, and now the sun's coming out. It's getting really bright in here. If it gets too bright, I'll, um, I'll just have to do the rest of the lecture with my eyes closed. I can get a little sloppy. This is the graphs with holes. And that, I believe, let me just double check this. This is um, right off of the handouts. So this is one of the handout problems. And we're supposed to graph this graph with a hole. So you'll get something like this on your exam. And um, let's go ahead and see if we can do this. The instructions would say graph neatly and label all intercepts and holes. So on the top, I see a difference of squares. I see uh, 4 minus x and a 4 plus x. And on the bottom, we have x plus 4. And I'll put parentheses around there. Now I can see that these two are the same. 4 plus x is the same as x plus 4. I'll write it out even though some of you don't need to see this. I'll write that out as x plus 4. And so that's the part that cancels. So I'm going to get a new function, and it's going to be the same except one's going to have a hole and one's not, and this is going to be y equals 4 minus x. So when those guys cancel, I mean we can do it slightly here when they cancel like that, that creates a hole in the graph. The hole is going to be, you find the x coordinate by setting the bottom, the, the part that canceled equal to 0. So I have x equals negative 4. So the hole is going to be at negative 4, comma. The y value of the hole comes from putting the x into the reduced expression there. So we have y equals 4 minus negative 4. y equals 8. So there's a hole in the graph at negative 4, 8. So we've got to remember at the end to put the hole in the graph. And now all I'm doing right here is graphing a line. So let's Go ahead and graph this line. You can plot some points. You can say, you know, if x is 4, y is 0. And if x is 0, y is 4. I went ahead and picked the intercepts. So we have 4 and 4. And, oh, I have a ruler here. Should have used it to do the axes. And so it's going to look like this. There's a line there. So here's 4, 4. And I've got to put a hole in the graph at negative 4, 8. So there is a hole. Right there at negative 4, 8, and there is the graph with the hole in it. Looking at the lighting here, okay, we're doing good, and at the time, 43 minutes, wow.
we'll get through this. Okay, let's go ahead and do the next problem. The last one that we'll do from chapter 4 is this one right here. It is a rational inequality, and it's going to probably remind you of that one that we did, which was a polynomial inequality, the first problem of this review. What we're going to do is factor the, t well, the first step is get zero on one side, and we do have zero on one side. The second step is factor the top and bottoms if you can factor them. So let's see if we can factor them. The top factors into x plus 2, x plus 3. The bottom factors into it's a difference of squares, x minus 1, x plus 1. Okay, so we end up calling this our function. You, you know, just name it. I'll call it f of x because I'm so creative. And um, then I take the zeros from the top and from the bottom. I'll put my number line here and I'll put them on the number line. So the zeros from the top would be setting each of those equal to zero. And the zeros from the bottom would be setting the bottom equal to zero. Okay, so I end up getting negative 2, negative 3, 1, and negative 1. Now I have to put those guys all on the same number line in the correct order. So I think we should know where things go. Negative 3, negative 2, negative 1. And we have one there, and they're all zeros. But two of them came from the bottom. And we cannot have zero on the bottom. Even though there are zeros of the bottom, we cannot have a fraction mean like 7 over 0. So I'm going to put on these ones, no. No, do not. That will never be included in the solution. Now I have five regions to check. But here's the quick way. Each of these factors is to the one power. So that means my signs will alternate. If one of them had a little 2 on there, and we were calling that a kiss when we did polynomials, then, then it would not alternate past that 0, and it would actually stay the same. The sign would stay the same as it passed the 0. But these are all ones where there's 1s on those, and so the signs will alternate. So let me go ahead and just pick a point anywhere that is not one of these guys, and I'll just pick zero. If I put zero into this function, I get plus, plus, minus, plus. So plus, plus, minus, plus. Now, how did I get that? I went zero plus two, so that's a plus. Two is plus, and then zero plus three is three. That's a plus. Zero minus one. That happens to be a minus, and then we have 0 plus 1 that's a plus. So this is going to give me a minus right here where 0 is located. Now, if you have trust issues, you could pick points from all the other regions. We'll just check, let's check negative 20, which is in this region over here, the very first region. You get negative 18, so that's a negative. A negative, a negative, and a negative, which actually four negatives make a positive. So let's just check if it does alternate minus, plus, minus, yeah, plus, we verified that, and then this one would be a plus. So you can go and check the other three regions if you want. I'm not going to do that. Okay. The next thing is, where is this function less than or equal to zero? Less than means we're looking for negatives. And equal to zero, we are going to include the ones that have zeros. But not the ones that say no. So an interval, no, no, interval notation, I'm describing the orange part, it goes from negative three to negative 2, brackets, 
And then from negative one to one, and that's where the orange part is. And so this covers this problem from 4.3. Let's go ahead and do a 5.1 problem and once again maybe try to do some of these on your own. This is number two. I'm only going to do half of it because the other three are pretty redundant. Um, so take some time to do this on your own. Okay. G of F of zero. That's the first one. That's going to be G of F of zero. So now I want to go, what is f of zero? I plug zero into f. That's going to be four minus zero. Which is four. And so this becomes g of four. So this guy right here that guy and that's the work that I showed. So what is g of 4? We're plugging 4 into g. It's going to be 1 minus 4 squared which is 1 minus 16 which gives us a negative 15. Okay the next one. So there's actually three problems here. It is f of g of negative 1. So this is f of g of negative 1. So now I've got to figure out what g of negative 1 is and I'll go ahead and do that up here. g of negative 1 is put negative 1 in for x. 1 minus negative 1 squared. So everywhere there's an x I put parentheses and inside those parentheses negative 1. Order of operations we do the exponent first 1 minus negative 1 quantity squared is 1. So 1 minus 1 is 0. g of negative 1 is 0. So I'm going to replace that green thing with a zero. And here's the work that I showed. So f of zero, we put zero up for where f is and we end up getting four. This also shows us that g of f, oh wait no it doesn't because we have different numbers there, but g of f does not equal f of g. They're not commutative in terms of com um, function composition. Now our last one is f of f of 2. Okay, so this is f of f of 2. So f of 2 is putting 2 into f. So this is, what would it be? Um, we put, sorry I'm going a little slow, I was thinking of an unrelated thing. We'd go 4 minus 2. So I won't write that out, this is actually going to be 2. Okay, now Look at this, so f of 2 equals 2. That's what we have there. And now we have f of 2, which 4 minus 2 equals 2. Okay, um, let's do one more that's not on there. f of f of negative 1. So go ahead and do that one. Okay, f of f of negative 1. Well, f of negative 1. You put negative 1 in there, you end up getting 4 minus a negative 1 or 4 plus 1, which is 5. And so this f of negative 1 
is 5. And what is f of 5? f of 5, you put 5 in there for minus 5 is negative 1. Okay, so that is function composition. Let's go ahead and do the next problem. It did get darker in here. It looks like it's raining outside. We are going to do problem number 18. And problem number 18 asks us to find g of f of x, f of g of x, and f of f of x and their domains. And notice in the last problem there were numbers there instead of x's. So let's go with g of f of x. This is g of f of x. So f of x happens to be 3 minus x squared. 3 minus x squared. Now I'll slow down here. So here's f of x. It gets replaced with that right there. Because that's what it is. Now I'm going to plug that into g. And when I do that, I'm going to end up, so g of 5 is square root of 5 plus 1, and g of 17 is the square root of 17 plus 1, and g of trash is square root of trash plus 1. So g of this junk is square root of this junk plus 1. This junk plus 1. So if you simplify under the square root, you end up getting the square root of 4 minus x squared. Okay, that is the answer for what is g of f of x. But they ask for the domain. Now the domain, this was the tricky part. It is, see, notice how if these were like little animals, it looks like f is getting eaten by g. So the domain is, you take the domain of the victim, that guy is the victim, his domain is all real numbers. And you throw it together with the domain of this guy. So what's the domain of this guy? This, this guy right here, you have a square root, and to find the domain, you have to say the thing that's under the square root has to be greater than or equal to zero. So we are finding this guy's domain. So the victim, I'll call this the crime scene. Okay, and the crime scene, well, we're finding its domain. Um, this is a quadratic inequality or a polynomial inequality. I'm going to factor. That's a difference of squares. I'm going to look at the zeros, which are um, 2 and negative 2, and I'm going to put them on a number line in the correct order. And then I'm going to do some test points. I uh, see that they alternate because there's ones up there. So if I put zero in, I get I get four, which is positive. And if I put five in, I'm going to get a negative. And if I put negative five in, I'm also going to get a negative. And so this is asking where do we see greater than or equal to zero? That would be where the plus is and where those zeros are. So the domain for the crime scene is negative 2 to 2 and um, you put these guys together you're really doing an intersection the domain of g of f happens to be put those together it's going to be this negative 2 to 2 so those are the two answers for the first part g of f of x Let's go ahead and do the next part. Okay, so what is f? Oh, by the way, this was a little traumatic for some of you. I mean, that, you know, it, it broke into a polynomial inequality. Okay, so let's not minimize 
the fact that there was some pain there when some of you saw that. So now we're computing fog, or f of g of x. So we have f of g of x. So this time the victim happens to be g of x. And he is getting eaten by f of x. f of x is having a good old lunch there. And so, you know, you plug things into f, like what is f of trash can? It's 3 minus trash can squared. So f of this junk, let's go ahead and write out what g is. He is this. Let's jump ahead there. So he's that right there. So f of this junk is 3 minus this junk squared. So I'm now writing f of this, 3 minus this junk squared. Now, we okay, the camera just stopped. I think it likes to stop after an hour. Check out the blurriness. It looks all right. I mean, not too blurry. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go 3 minus this junk squared, you have a square and a square root, they sort of, you're, you're going this times itself, they're going to go away and you're just going to have an x plus 1. But you have that minus in front of it. So this is 3 minus x minus 1. And this is actually going to give us 2 minus x. So Here's the victim. Here's the crime scene. And so the, um, the domain of the crime scene in this example is all real numbers. So that we try to bold the R. So if you were wondering why it looked like that, it's we try to make a bold R. And um, the domain of the victim, well, now the victim He's not like F. F could eat anything. This guy, to find his domain, you take this x plus 1 and you say it has to be greater than or equal to 0. It's not as bad as the last one that we did. So x has to be greater than or equal to negative 1. So you go ahead and you put this together with this. We're doing an intersection really of those two things. And you end up just getting the domain of this guy is all real numbers greater than or equal to negative 1. And in interval notation, it looks like this. Negative 1 to infinity. And there it is. Which is funny, because if you just saw this guy walking down the street, you would think he can eat whatever he wants. But you feed this guy a negative 2, even though it looks like he would spit out a 4, he's going to die. Because the, the way his intestines work, the negative 2 is going to go right here. And then you're going to take the square root of a negative number. And he does not do so good with imaginary numbers if you feed him that. Let's go ahead and do the last one on this problem. The last one on this problem says f of f of x. So, we have f of f of x. So, f is eating itself. That's kind of gross. Or the factory drawing, you would put something into the factory, it would come out, you'd take it off the conveyor belt and put it back at the beginning, and then it would go through the factory again. So, maybe the factory drawing is better for this. I'm going to go ahead and replace f of x with what it is. 3 minus x squared. Okay. So I'm going to put a 3 minus x squared everywhere I see an x right there. So let's go ahead and do that. Everybody see what happened? So that, that x right there got replaced with this because that's what it says to do. I'm going to go ahead and multiply this out. Um, doing a foil. First, outside, inside will give me negative 6x squared, and last gives me a plus x to the fourth. 
we go ahead and we distribute the negative sign, so minus 9, and we have plus 6x squared minus x to the fourth. And we combine like terms. I'll put the negative x to the fourth up front, negative x to the fourth. And then we have plus 6x squared minus 6. That is what the composition looks like. So these ones are a lot harder when you have the x there. There's more algebra than if you have like the number 2 there. So the victim is that guy. And his domain is all real numbers because you don't see any square roots or fractions or logarithms. And this guy, he's the crime scene. And his domain is also all real numbers. So the domain of this composition, f of f, if you're going to put those together, it's all real numbers. And so that's how you do problem number 18. That's a problem that took kind of a long time. They're not all going to take this long of a time. Go ahead and do another one from 5.1. Write p of x as a composition of two non-identity functions. That just means you don't want to write f of x equal um, x for one of yours. So let's go ahead and say we want to write this as g of f of x equals this right here. So basically what you want, I mean this g of f is really g of f of x. What you want is you want f, he's the inside function, which we've been calling the victim. So what they want in this problem is they want you to identify what f could be for this and what g could be. Now there's not a unique answer, but there's one on this one that a lot of people would pick for f. What looks like it's on the inside? Well, it would be x squared minus x plus 1. And then the thing that happens to that when you put it into g is you're taking it to the fifth power. So g is going to be x to the fifth. And think about it. If you go ahead and you plug this function inside g, you put it where the x is, you'll get x squared plus x uh, minus x plus 1 quantity to the fifth. That's your answer. So this is going to come up in calculus when you do something called the chain rule. Okay. Problem number 44. Find f of g of 3. f of g of 3. So the first thing you want to do is you want to consult function g and say, what is g of 3? So we're looking here and you look for the first coordinate of 3. Ah, here it is. So g of 3 is actually going to equal 2. Kind of smeared the ink on there. And now you're going to go f of 2. So you're going to consult this function, say, hey, where is the first coordinate 2? Right there. And you're going to get the answer of 4. The output is 4. And so there we have, what is it? We're kind of wasting paper here, aren't we? We're conserving toilet paper and we're wasting scratch paper for the problems. Oh well, it's not wasting if, if you guys are, are watching these videos. Okay, draw the inverse. And then, then Classify. Let's do part B first. So it says, is this not a function? Is it a function but not one-to-one? -one? Or is it a one-to-one -one function? So is this thing a function? To see if it's a function, you do the um, horizontal, no, sorry. You do the vertical line test to see if it's a function. And so every vertical line hits it at most one time. So it is a function. Is it one-to-one? -one? Well, you do the horizontal line test and it hits it twice in many places. So it is not one-to-one. -one. 
which means the answer for part B is that this is a function, but it's not one to one. Okay, draw the inverse. So this also means that when we draw the inverse, the inverse is not going to be a function. You take points, you know, like you have the point on here. This point right here is negative 2, 0, and then you have another key point which would be 0, 3, and another key point which is 1, 0. To do the inverse, you switch your inputs and outputs. So this would be 0, negative 2, 3, 0, and 0, 1. And you're going to plot those three points. So we have 0, negative 2, which is right here. Let me do it in a thicker pin here. Um, 0, negative 2 is right here. Then we have 3, 0. I'm using red here. 3, 0 is right here. And then we have 0, 1, which is right here. Now you got to be careful how you connect these points together. It's going to be these two points that are connected, 0, negative 2, and 3, 0. And here it goes. Those are connected. And then you're going to connect that one with the 0, 1. I'm going to have to turn this to the side here to connect it. And so that right there, if the original graph was called F, well, that's kind of bad because then we'd have to call this one F inverse and it's not a function. So let's just say those are inverses of each other. And you could, we didn't use this, but you can see if I put the line Y equals X right there, you can see that the red graph is a reflection of the black graph through that line. Okay, so there's the answer. Let's move to the next problem. Another one from 5.2. We found the inverse graphically. Let's go find the inverse algebraically. So there were four steps. The first step was replace the f of x with a y. Step two is swap your x and y's. So everywhere there's a y, you put an x. Everywhere there's an x, you put a y. Okay, so why did I make it in blue? Because this graph is different from that graph. This blue graph is the inverse, but since they're asking us to find the inverse as a function, we have to now, step three, solve for y. Maybe what we should do is multiply by a five to get rid of those fractions. Five x equals one minus two y. Okay, I'm solving for y here. I'm going to subtract 1 on both sides. So 5x minus 1 equals negative 2y. Let's go ahead and divide, let's, let's write it up here. Negative 2y equals 5x minus 1. And I'll divide everything by negative 2. You could just um, divide both sides by negative 2 if you want. You have y equals negative 5 halves x plus 1 half. You have two negatives there. Okay, the last step of this problem is to replace the y with this notation, f inverse x. And so this is also going to be a line, just like that was a line. They should be the same creature, just like in our drawing. The other thing was the same. Notice this red guy kind of looks like he's related to this original graph. And so these guys are the same creatures. We have um, our answer right there. Let's go ahead and do another one. And then we'll, we'll 
spend the rest of the problems in 6.1, spend the rest of the time doing problems in 6.1. So find f inverse, and here is the function. f of x is y And now we're going to go ahead and swap x's and y's. So I'm going to have x equals 2y over 1 minus y. So what I want to do now is I want to solve for y. It's going to be the hardest part of this problem. I'm going to multiply both sides by 1 minus y. And so I'm going to have 1 minus y times x equals, and the 1 minus y is cancel there, 2y. Okay, now some people would say, hey, let's divide by 2, and then you'll have y by itself. But the problem is, you'll have y on the left-hand side as well. So what we want to do is distribute the x and write this as x minus xy equals 2y. I'm going to bring all my terms that have y's on one side of the equation and the non-y's stay on the other side. So I have x equals 2y plus xy. And so I'm going to now factor out a y And I'm trying to solve for y, so I'm going to now divide both sides by 2 plus x. And so let's just kind of turn this around, and we have y equals x over 2 plus x. Or on the bottom, if you prefer, you could put x plus 2. I'll just keep it this way. And our last step is replacing that y with f inverse x. And so both of these are rational functions. They, we, they're not the same, but they're kind of the same creature. They look like this. they belong to the same family. 6.1. Um, so this comes from one of the problems um, from the handout. Type 1 exponential equations. Let's solve this type 1 exponential equation. I want to get a common base. And I know, you know, you might think, well, maybe 4 is a common base because 16 is 4 squared. But, let's see, well, let's check. 4 times 4, maybe it is. 16 times 4, 64. Wow, so 64 is 4 cubed, and 16 is... 4 squared. Okay, so the reason I was kind of caught off guard is I was just thinking we'll just make the common base 2, which would be all right. That would also work out. We'll just do this way here. So we have a power to a power. We multiply. And then we have 4 to this equals 4 to that. What do we do with the this and the that? you set them equal to each other. And that comes from the one-to-one -one property of exponential functions. But usually when I say that, no one seems to care, so maybe I'll stop saying that. Um, so x is going to equal two-thirds. There's our answer. So that's the type 1 exponential equation. Let's go ahead and evaluate some logarithms. So how do we evaluate logarithms? Um, there are log properties that are found on the website. So you can print those out and try to memorize them. Um, the first one of these might be the hardest one. This is, I'll, write, I'll do this problem off to the side. Log base 8 of 4. And so I'm going to set that equal to an x. So you should know how to go from log form to exponential form. We said in the notes that's like going from Superman to Clark Kent. You're writing the same person. Just a, This is just a definition. So the base is 8. 
the exponent is not going to be 4, it's going to be x. And this is going to equal 4. A common base, now we have a type 1 exponential equation. The common base is 2, so this is 2 cubed to the x. And then this is 2 squared. This is 2 to the 3x. Multiply those. 2 squared. We have 2 raised to this equals 2 raised to that. This equals that. x equals, wow, some great problems I picked. The last one had the answer of 2 thirds. The answer is not going to always be 2 thirds. But this here is 2 thirds. Okay. So, you can do the rest of the problems, you know, doing it this way. You can remember some of the properties. Some of the properties, one of the properties had a log base B of B. And so, if you can remember that property, you can just say what the answer is. Or, maybe you already know, like, 36 to what power gives you 36? One is the answer. Okay. This one, the LN means log base e. And so there was another property which I called the popping property, one of the popping properties, where if this is the same as that, then the result is just 3. The other way of doing this is e to what power equals e to the third. e to what power gives you e to the third is going to be 3. So logarithms are just exponents. If you want, you can pull this off to the side, set it equal to x like we did over here, and do the problem that way. Okay, there's another property of logs that whenever the argument is 1, it's always going to equal the same thing. Now, if you forgot that, you could set it equal to x and do what we did over here. You might be able to get this by going 13 to what power gives you 1. Well, the property, or however you do it, you're going to get 0 for that one. There's another property. I think this is property 4, where if you have a 7 here and a 7 there, I call this another popping property where that goes away and you get a 3. We derived it in the notes. And then this one right here is we are going to go ahead and write this 10 to a power. It looks like it's 10 to the 11th, but this ninth root is the bottom of the fraction of the power. So remember that roots grow, up, grow under the ground and the log doesn't seem to have a base but when it's written like that it's base 10. So then this thing goes pop and you get 11 over 9. Now I'm kind of I'm looking at the time here and I went a little fast on these ones and you can go slow and do it your way um, the reason why is I wanted to kind of fit this review into a proper time allotment. So that is evaluating logarithms. Find the domain. How do I find the domain of this? Well, I know there's two problems here. There's a fraction and there's the logarithm. Let's take care of the fraction. We know that x cannot equal 0. We also know that the argument of the log has to be greater than 0. So I'm going to solve that inequality. x has to be greater than, subtract 1 on both sides, negative 1. So now what you're doing is you're taking the intersection of all real numbers except 0 and all real numbers greater than negative 1. You're taking the intersection. And so let's just look at this number line here. We have negative 1 and we have 0. This guy right here is saying, hey, we can do anything that's greater than negative 1. This guy right here is saying, hey, we can do all real numbers on the bottom except 0. So this is what I mean we're taking the intersection. We are saying, where do you see both colors? You see both colors not at negative 1, but between negative 1 and 0. 
not at zero because we don't see green there and some of you are like yeah I see some green there but there's a hole there and then you see both colors beyond so the domain oh by the way they're going to ask for it in interval notation and so we describe this in interval notation we say negative one to zero union zero to infinity so there is the domain of a log two more problems that I want to crank out here's the first problem right here is we are to graph this okay so how do we graph this well what I want to do is graph something different the mother graph looks like g of x equals 2 to the x now yes it's true that we could just plot points and graph our graphs that way let's just go ahead and do transformations on this so 2 to the x if you've done a few of these you see that you'll always have the point 0 1 on these graphs and you'll always have the point 1 B and in this case it would be 1 2 and you'll always have this runway so there's the original graph I'm not going to graph the whole thing yeah maybe I should but it never asked for this okay so there is your exponential graph so what this is is 2 to the x minus 1 this takes the mother graph and shifts it down one and so when it goes down one everything goes down one the horizontal asymptote goes down one and it becomes y equals negative one this point at zero one now is at zero zero and this point at one two is now at one one and so what happens is your graph ah, I missed the point shifts down one and your your final graph is this black graph okay let's go ahead and do our last problem this could be the scariest one this is a logarithm a logarithmic graph and the mother graph happens to be log base 2 of x so let's try to remember what the mother graph looks like and then we'll shift it so here's X here's Y on this mother graph and she kind of looks like this graph the exponential graph but sort of on the side and we're, you can go back on the notes the video on the notes and look at that so you, this this is always going to have a vertical asymptote it's always going to have a an x intercept at one and um, because if you put one in there log base two of one remember that property it's zero and then log base two of two is one so the graph looks like that that's how log graphs look like but remember if you turn it like this it does look like an exponential graph okay so what am I going to do with this I'm gonna go ahead and shift this thing to to the right so there's two transformations two to the right and then minus in front of it reflects through which axis well, it would be the x axis kind of like if there is a minus in front of the x squared now lots of times you saw me you know in the notes saying well hey f of x is negative g of x minus 2 and that might help some of you with with this right here okay so let's see if we can do this we'll make our intermediate graph be green we're going to go two to the right so that means um, that's left okay so whew. 
Two to the right means this vertical wall is going to go right here. And then this point right here, which is at 1 comma 0, will be right here. Two to the right. And then this point right here. So this is at 3 now. And this point, which is at 2, 1, will now be at 4, 1. And I'm not going to draw the green graph because I don't want to have graph overload on this. But the graph looks like the red graph. And then we're going to reflect it through the x-axis. Now the reflection through the x-axis, it's going to keep the vertical asymptote the same. It gets reflected through the x-axis, nothing happens to it. And this guy gets reflected through the x-axis, nothing happens to him because he's on the x-axis. But this guy at 4, 1 will now go to 4, negative 1. So you have this point and this point and the wall. And there is your log graph. So this completes the review for the exam. Study hard, and I will see you in the next video.